all week long. I'm like, Lord, I gotta, I, I'll shut up, brother. I said, Lord, these young people have got a future. they got to live in this world. they got to find something in this world they can do and survive and get through it and still keep you in the middle. And the hardest thing in the world is to try to preach what you got to preach and, and withdrawal, he said, you're in the world, but not of it. So you just got to get into the place where, okay, I'm going to survive. And you know what you need? You need to be constantly revived. You, you need to have a constant mindset of revival and before the Lord and just you and him and get that thing where you can move. And that's what I hope happens this week. That's what I want. And I hope that's what you want too. So uh, make it a point to be here every service. And by the end of the week, uh, you might be a little bit better. At least you'll make it to Thursday morning. How about that? <laughs> All right, well, it's good to be here. I have been, uh, believe it or not, uh, pretty nervous. And somebody asked me just this week, not a, not a saved man either, but a, a friend of mine, and he said, uh, you know, you've been doing it a long time, right? I said, yeah. And I, I told him, you know, I, I'll, I'll be gone next week and all that. And he said, uh, how do you do that, like get up in front of people and speak? I said, it's really hard. He said, still? I said, yeah. He said, you still get nervous? I said, yeah. Like, you wouldn't believe, but I think it's on another level here because of uh, how I feel about your pastor um, and about this church. You folks have just been more of a blessing, I think, to me and my family than you even realize, and it's good to have some good friends and just a like-minded church. It's easier to preach somewhere like this uh, because of your spirit, your heart for the truth and for the word of God, and so we'll find out how easy it is, right? But usually it's easier, so I've been praying that that would be the case, but uh, I have taken this as seriously as I've taken any opportunity God's ever given me, and I really hope and pray to be a blessing. I won't be too formal in the introductions here, because I'll probably do that this morning. I imagine there will be folks there that don't know us in the morning service, but most all of you, I think, already do. I'll say this, I was just ready to sit down and let him keep going because he was reading my mind, he, had, he was preaching my outline, you wouldn't believe it, and uh, it flooded my heart, just sitting there just now, it flooded my heart with joy because it was like, okay Lord, I know I'm where you want me to be because the Spirit of God put us right in tune without even talking about it uh, this morning. I, I had this bad dream this week, the dream was this, the dream was I was sitting in this church and I was called up to preach, and I'm like, I didn't know he was preaching me. I got nothing. Like, I didn't prepare. I'm like, well, oh, oh, boy, here we go. And uh, then it hit me. They do Sunday school. So we started our church 14 and a half years ago. We were in a living room, so we just did a Sunday morning worship. We all brought a, a dish to pass. We had lunch together, and then we did an afternoon service, and we were done for the day. Now we do the morning and evening, but we just meet at 1030 in the morning, and we have like an hour and a half long service. The kids will go out to junior church and uh, we don't do Sunday school. And it hit me like Sunday school before Sunday morning. So I found out yesterday I'm doing Sunday school. <laughs> Hooray. Praise the Lord. And the second the thought hit me, the Lord put this passage on my mind and heart. And then your pastor was just reading my mind. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 this morning. Uh, I will do my best to teach, okay? Uh, I, I, when I teach, sometimes I get a little preachy, so you, you got to forgive me. And uh, when I preach, I try to remember to, to do a little teaching. So um, I'm going to try just to teach here on this subject in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. But I want to read the passage with you here real quickly, and then we'll get into it. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some. So what he's saying is, when I come to be with you, I don't want to treat you the same way I have to treat some other people. There's some people I treat really aggressively. There's some people I get right up in their grill. There's some people I'm in their face. And when I come to you, I don't want to come to you that way. He's saying in verse 2, if you continue, which think of us, these are the people whose face he gets in, they think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. You all know this passage. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds 
casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do, do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If a man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him think of himself this, uh, think this, let him of himself think this again. That as he is Christ, even so we are we Christ's. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech contemptible. Let's pray. Father, I love you this morning. I ask you to please... Be with my mind. I ask you to be with my mouth. I want you to fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. I want to be a, a vessel that you can use, sanctified meat for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. I ask you to make me a blessing this week, Father, and I pray you'd start it right now. Help me to be in tune with you. I believe uh, that this is a great church, Father, and I, I don't want to do anything to cause any harm. I don't want to be out of your will. I want to just follow you closely. I want to be a blessing and a help. Uh, to my friends here at this church, and um, Lord, maybe leave a spiritual blessing behind when I go. I pray that you do something this week. Uh, I pray that visitors would come, that souls would be saved, that Christians would be edified and encouraged. Maybe somebody is struggling with some sin, that they'd be able to get the victory this week, that somebody that's discouraged and about to get out, Father, that they'd be encouraged and strengthened and helped. God, if you do that, we'll know it's you. We pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now look at verse number one. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. So Paul in verse number one is making a defense of himself. He's saying what I'm doing, I, Paul, myself, I'm begging you. And what I'm doing is I'm begging you by somebody else's approach. The meekness and gentleness that Jesus Christ has is what I am trying to use and take on me. I'm trying to use this avenue to reach you. Because I care about you. He says, who in presence and base among you. When I, when I get around you, you've noticed I'm really not anything special. When, I, when I'm there with you, I'm the lowest really that there is. My bodily presence is weak. My speech is contemptible. And he said, when I write these letters, being absent, I am bold towards you. I wrote a very tough letter when I gave you 1 Corinthians. What he's doing in verse number one is he's defending himself. And Paul, as you study through 2 Corinthians especially, seems to be very aggravated that he has to defend himself. He's very frustrated by some things that are going on. And, and notice in verse number 10, you see sort of the parentheses on either side of what he's going to say in between. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. So what had happened is somebody has come along and they've begun to undermine the Apostle Paul and his ministry to the church at Corinth. What they're doing is they're tools of the devil. What I want to talk about just briefly is how the devil works. <laughs> and I don't like talking much about the devil, but the Bible tells us how he works so that we can be aware of it. The preacher was just mentioning it at the beginning here of the service. He was saying how how rough things are, how, how much things have intensified in the last 10 years. And I think they're fixing to get more intense. I don't know about you, but I know my wife and I, and talking to Brother Joe and Miss Paige yesterday, and talked to the preacher yesterday morning on the phone, and it seems like when you're coming close to revival, everything, is it just us, or has other people just kind of had everything coming unglued? Sometimes it's definable. You know exactly what's happening. And there's other times where it's really not even definable. You're like, I, I should be thankful, everything should be wonderful, but for some reason I'm feeling this frustration, I'm feeling this edginess, I'm feeling this pressure on me, and, and it's not always something we can even define. That's how you understand that it's actually spiritual. Paul is very frustrated here because he's done a lot of work. Go back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I want you to see the, the setting here as we, before we get into this passage. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and look at verse number 15. The Apostle Paul, as you know, had come through Corinth and he had planted this church. He was, he was spiritually their father. Now, he was never asking them to call him that. That was not his spiritual title, you know, call me Father, father Paul, you know, Dr. Reagan. You know, that was hilarious. I'm going to put that on the sign. I said, I'll shoot myself right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors 
in Christ. You see that? Yet have ye not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. What Paul had done is he had gone there under the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. God chose a man and that man's name was the Apostle Paul. Paul went into Corinth and he did what God called him to do. And God blessed the work that God had called Paul to do. And these souls are saved and a church is established. Now there's really no question about who spiritually speaking, that's the illustration he's using as a father, spiritually speaking who their father was, there's absolutely no doubt. But what had happened is once God had done something special and God had showed up and God had begun to move, that the devil begins sending people in there when they notice that there's something happening. Everybody else wants to come in and sort of become leeches, bloodsuckers on the body that God had put there because they see their opportunity to take the easy road into being somebody and getting a chance to preach and getting a chance to teach. And so they always wind up coming in whenever God calls a man to do something and God's doing that work God's way. Always do the instructors come around to try to start leading people astray. So Paul's frustrated with that. He's like, you got one father, but you got 10,000 instructors. And boy, we see it today more than ever. You know, you, they don't even have to come into our churches anymore. When we started our church, they would come in. It was unbelievable to me the way they showed up. I had some big shot show up. I mean, he had wrote a book that you could buy at, the, at Barnes & Noble's bookstore, and he was on the big radio station in our area, and he was, you know, he said his name like I was supposed to know it, you know. Hey, I'm Dr. Roo. And I'm, I'm like, okay. Thanks for coming. Have a seat. You know, he's giving me all his credentials, and I'm like, you know, I wasn't anywhere near as nice back then as I'm trying to be nowadays. You know, it's not necessarily me, but I'm trying, you know. I was like, I'm preaching. Sit down. Thanks for coming. You know what he was doing? He was just instantly, he tried to, tried to infiltrate that ministry. He tried to infiltrate that little work. He invited me to dinner, and he was going to, you know, he was, I want to take you out to lunch, you know. He let me know what subdivision he lived in because, of course, it was an affluent subdivision, which was supposed to impress me. And we're sitting there at dinner, at lunch, and he said something to me. A little red flag popped up in my soul, in my spirit. He said, if I had a little church like yours. And I thought, well, you don't. Where's your blood, sweat, and tears? Why are you showing up all of a sudden when God's starting to move and do something? Who do you think you are showing up here? And he's bringing in his information and trying to pass it out around my church. You know what that is? That's a work of the devil. That's demonic. Amen. Amen. We're having a men's prayer meeting and he walks in and he won't kneel down. He wants to stand while we're all kneeling down and praying. And he told us all that all of our prayers are wrong. You know what he was? He was a staunch five-point Calvinist. And since we were just pouring out our hearts to God in prayer, he wouldn't be a part of it. He was there to lecture us on, on the sovereignty of God, you know. It, and it was just one after the other. It got to the point in the early days of the church where when a visitor came, I wasn't even happy. Unless they had tattoos all over, man. I mean, gauges, tattoos, biker chains, the whole nine yards. I, Praise the Lord, man. God sent a real visitor. It's not one from the devil. If they looked like they were put together at all, religious at all, I was just, just, hi, who are you? Where are you from? What do you believe? What are you doing here? Why do you want to be here? You got a church already? Go back to your church. Leave us alone, man. Because it was that much pressure all the time. You know what happens nowadays? You got it right there in your hand, and there's all kinds of instructors trying to come along and tell you what you should believe and how you should believe it, and trying to undermine the work that God's doing here in a local Bible-believing church through the man that God put here, and there's no doubt about that. You got, what, 15, 16, 17 years or something like that of proof that God's in it, the test of time. Every time a young woman comes to me and my wife for advice and counsel about somebody she's dating, you know what our number one advice is? Oh, he's a great guy, and he loves the Lord, and he's carrying his Bible, and listens to preaching all the time, and he's so sweet, and he's so wonderful. You know what we say? T-I-M-E. All caps, bold, block, bright colors. It takes time to figure it out. Give it time. Slow down. You know what time has proven? It's proven who God put here to be your pastor. You know what the devil's going to do to any church? He's going to come in and he's going to try to infiltrate that church. What he did originally in Corinth is he came after their flesh. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 as we head back to our passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, please. 
He had come in and he'd come in through the flesh. And you know the story. I mean, that church was so wicked and so carnal that they had a man in there who was committing adultery with his father's wife, his stepmother. And the whole church knew about it, and the whole church had just kind of accepted it. It was very much like the modern-day church, the modern-day Christianity, you know, ultra-grace stuff, you know. I mean, we just love, love, and love, and more love, and it's all, well, we're loving, and God's forgiven, and it's under the blood, and you can just go on with it because it's under the blood, and, you know, we're supposed to love them to Jesus and keep loving them to Jesus. And it's like, this guy's already born again. What are you talking about? This guy knows better. Where are you getting that? And, and, and he was in the church, and the church wasn't doing anything about it. Paul sent that first letter rebuking them sharply, saying, get that thing right, because that's wrong, and God won't bless a church that puts up with that kind of just flagrant in-your-face sin. Now, let me qualify this, because I'm a pastor, okay? I'm not just, like, hammer everybody all the time. There are people in my church that have serious, and I mean serious, issues and I'd be willing to bet you there's some here too even though your pastor doesn't tell me all about it and I'm thankful he doesn't because now if I God gets you this week you know it's not a setup is the Lord I mean real problems come to me sometimes even like super nervous to even come to me like I need to talk to you and it's like I, I know <laughs> trust me I know you can tell sometimes and say, Pastor, I just, I have this problem. And it's like, listen, relax. They're thinking you're just going to bounce them out of church, right? I'm talking born-again people that struggle with some big problems, addictions, a lot of things that are not acceptable. I need help. When you have a problem and you are condemned by that problem and you're struggling under that problem and you're not happy with that thing but sin's got a hold of you you know where you need to be that's where you, you know what the devil will tell you you're a hypocrite you come to church and singing the songs and answering how many times have you answered the altar call? are you answering the altar call again you're a hypocrite just you know what you know what? You have a bad attitude. You have a bad spirit. I had somebody tell me that one time. You know what? We just had the, we just are struggling right now. We got a bad spirit, and we don't want to ruin the service because we got a great church. We love our church, and we feel like when we come with our bad spirit that we're going to pull it all down. I said, you give yourself way too much credit. I said, you come with your bad spirit, and you just sit in church, and you just let God work on you, but don't get out of church just because you're sideways, just because you're messed up, just because sin's got a hold of you, and the devil, the accuser, the brethren, wants to make sure he rubs that in your face. Don't give yourself so much credit that you're going to be able to just blow the whole thing up. God didn't show up, and souls didn't get saved, and preacher couldn't preach because I'm backslidden. Like, okay, so when God does bless the service, it was all about you? Right? The church is growing because I'm right with Jesus, you know? Think about that for a minute. This is a place where people that have problems need to be. That is utterly different than when somebody's going around the church like, hey, man, you know where I can get some heroin? You want some? You know where I can get some illegal pills? You know, the doctor prescribes them, so that's a gray area we can hide it under. It's stinking illegal. It's a federal offense. It's, it's a felony. You understand that? It's wrong. You know where I can get some pills? Drug deals. You know what I'm saying? You start that kind of stuff, and now that's what was going on in the Corinthian church, and they were all putting up with it. Do you see the difference? The devil tries to come in there through the flesh. Paul writes that letter, and he's, he's like, listen, you better put that out from among you. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, lest Satan should get advantage of us for not ignorant of his devices. You know what had happened is this guy had gotten right. He had dealt with the sins of the flesh which is the first area the devil's going to try to attack in because it's just the easiest one. Sometimes it's not even the devil, it's just us. And, and he attacks there, but when Paul wrote that letter, that church had gotten that thing right. They had judged the man, which is, oh, how could you? I mean, nowadays nobody does church discipline anymore. And so they did what God told them to do when they got the inspired letter from Paul, the message from the one that led them to Jesus Christ that God had used to establish that work. They got that thing right. They did the hard thing, which was deal with the guy. The guy repented and got right with God. And the whole church is rejoicing when he's 
he's back in. It's like, praise the Lord, man. What a glorious testimony. What a wonderful thing. Paul's commending him for that. And he's saying, listen, when you forgive him, I forgive him. If you, say he's for, if you forgive him, I forgive him. Why? Because we don't want the devil to get in there and get advantage of him. Let Satan get advantage of us for we're not ignorant of his devices. We know how the devil works. Keep going with me if you would, please. I want you to go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And then we'll come back to chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, please look at verse 13. Uh, verse 12. But I would, but what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. So he's talking about these guys. He's still, still dealing with these guys who had come in there and tried to undermine the Apostle Paul and his ministry. That wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. He says, these guys, and, and for the sake of time, I just got to tell you, these guys are glorying in the flesh. What they've done is they've come in. We just talked about the flesh, right? And the sins of the flesh that the addictions and guys committing adultery and all that or, or fornication and all that stuff, right? The big sins, the way we view them. He's saying these guys come in and they're super spiritual. They're super slick. They're super holy. They love God. They believe the Bible. These are great guys, right? They're great instructors. They come in and they razzle dazzle you with all they know about the word of God. They're smooth in their speech and their personality. They're slick, man. They make everybody like them. Them. everybody's naturally attracted to them they're charismatic you know some some guys have come into my church and tried to make themselves the the center of attention and they never bothered me i'm not trying to be mean but i'm just like he ain't got it <laughs> he's obnoxious he's not smooth he doesn't know what he's doing he's not he that don't bother me what bothers me is the ones that are super intelligent super smooth got it all together and know how to be real sweet with everybody you know that's what they're doing. They're coming in there, and what they're doing is they're glorying in the flesh. They're telling them all about their degrees, and they're telling them all about their Bible knowledge and where they graduated from. And, and what they'll do, and you, you just mark it down, what they'll do is they'll fish. Talking about the way the devil works, right? He works in the flesh, right? Paul's talking in 2 Corinthians 10. We read it, though we walk in the flesh. What they do is they, they, they're slick. They'll start fishing, so they just throw the bait out there and they'll see who will bite on it. The bait will be something like, well, you know, Brother Elliot, he's a really good guy, but you know. Well, you know how he is. And they'll always start targeting his flesh. He said, we walk in the flesh. Paul said, they're drawing attention to my flesh. The devil always starts to target the flesh. When the devil wants to split a church or start causing division in a church or start stirring things up in a church or start blocking what God wants to do in a church, he'll start getting you worried about somebody else's flesh and what they do and how they do it and how they don't do it and their kids and their spouse and their marriage and their money. And he'll start trying to mess and just cr start creating that rub in the church. Listen, we are all in the flesh. Every last one of us, including the preacher. If you want to latch onto the flesh, you're going to be able able to latch onto the flesh. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be teaching. <sighs> because we all got it. What they do is they come in while they look like they got their flesh so spit polished and shined and it's so perfect and it's so together that you can't catch them on a thing. Man, he's holy. Man, he's godly. Man, he knows his Bible. Man, he's smooth. And he'll start pointing out at somebody who's real you know what I like about your pastor? And I mean this from the depths of my heart. You know what I like about him? He is 100% real. Amen. I could care less for politicking, bootlicking, apple polishing, boot shining preachers. I just can't stand it. I like a guy that's just himself. What they'll do is they'll capitalize on that. And they'll try to pull your attention to, well, you know, Paul, his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible, but boy, he sure does act tough behind his letters. And he gets behind the pulpit. He sure lets it rip. But, man, you ever sit down with him in the office? He's awful sweet in the office. And one-on-one, -on -one, he ain't man enough to say that to my face. When he's trying to be gracious, he's trying to beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He's trying to make sure that he has the balance between being a preacher of the Word of God and a pastor of the individuals. And they try to take that and twist it to get in your mind, which is our second point for this morning. But what they're really after is the flesh. And they pretend like they're not. Look at how clean and holy and righteous and godly I am. 
It's a device of the devil. It's religion. He said, what I'm doing now and glorying and pointing out to you that I'm your father and showing you my credentials and drawing attention to the sacrifice I've made, the work I've done, and the way I approach things is, is I'm trying to cut off those guys. I'm trying to get ahead of them. I'm trying to make sure that, that you can see. I'm trying to expose the enemy that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Yeah, I know he's bragging himself up, and I know he's trying to make you see how great and wonderful he is, but let me show you the truth. For such, verse 13, are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. See how they do it? You know where the devil really works? In religion. Oh, you say, that's the church up the road, that's the other denomination. Well... If what your pastor said is true, and I believe with all my heart it is, and we're getting close to the end times and the pressure's increasing, you don't think the devil's going to come after King James Bible-believing, independent, fundamental, rightly dividing churches like this that are all about reaching people for Jesus Christ and getting ready for the, second, for the, for the rapture. You don't think the devil's going to try to work somewhere like this? I was telling somebody recently, because for years I've preached, you and I probably aren't even on the devil's radar. We're just not that important, right? And most of the time, my problems are probably my own flesh, to be honest with you. That's the, the, the devil does work through the flesh. He knows the weakness of the flesh, and he will go after it. But here's something I think the Lord might have showed me, and I'm not sure, you know, you can take it or leave it. This is just my opinion. We're getting to be a smaller and smaller crew. So it's just not that hard to track them. It's not that many really big churches anymore, big Preachers, you know, making it happen and seeing hundreds and hundreds of souls saved. So if we're actually fizzling out and there's less and less as we get closer and closer to the coming of Jesus Christ, that will bring us up higher and higher on the devil's radar. Does that make sense? He's warning them about the devil's attack. He's warning them about how the devil's working. These false apostles and deceitful workers transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That's how he shows up. Spiritual. Probably even carrying a King James Bible and voting for Trump. <laughs> Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Paul's warning them about how the devil works. Go back to 2 Corinthians 10 and let's look at it real fast. Verse number 3. He says... Listen, I, I, I'm telling you something. I'm talking about they, they, they think we walk according to the flesh. Verse 2, for though we walk in the flesh, and we do, we do not war after the flesh. Satan tries to make that attack on our flesh. We don't have time to turn there because I want to be done on, at the right time here this morning. But Ephesians chapter 2 tells you that you used to. Right? We used to walk according to the course of this world. We used to walk after the flesh. We don't anymore. We're still in the flesh. That's the problem. That's why the devil gets an opportunity. That's how he gets an advantage is because we're just nothing more than humans. You ever hear the saying, don't meet your heroes? Right? Just, just, just keep that nice distance between you and the person you hero worship. Because as soon as you get close enough to them, you're going to see the chinks in their armor. You're going to see the crack in that vessel that the Lord has made. The devil wants to make a crack in that vessel because that vessel that the potter has built is intended to hold oil. It's intended to hold the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be filled with the Spirit. The devil's always trying to get to us and make a crack in the flesh so that that thing will leak, right? Never forget years ago, Brother Lynch said that some charismatic lady came to him and asked him if he get filled with the Spirit. And he said, yeah, I, I, I have, but I got a leak. Don't you? They're always wanting to draw the attention to that crack in the vessel. So we walk after the flesh, but we don't war after the flesh. There's a constant rub there between our flesh and the world. We used to walk after it. What do we war after now? Verse number uh, 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What you got to understand is that the Corinthian culture was a very fleshy culture. The city around them, much like the modern day church. You know what's around us? You know what's in our face all the time? I don't care how careful you are about your phone or about your television. You know what's in your face all the time? Fleshiness. 
That was what Corinth was like. They had temples and shrines there, and in those temples, they'd have these, these shrines set up and these, these little idols set up made out of clay, coincidentally. And they would have, they were different, they were fashioned after different body parts because they believed that when people would come in for healing and they, they had these shrines there that they could get, they could receive healing for their body based on the different sicknesses that they'd have. And they made these little clay things that they're just, just filthy, just body focused all the time. And I, in mixed company, I'm not even comfortable to get into all that would go on in their worship services, all the filthy fornication that would happen in their religions. And folks, it's all over nowadays. I was driving through a, uh, what was it, Trenton, uh, uh, Friday. And uh, I was, it's way down river. I, I had to go find a, a keto birthday cake for my wife because her birthday's tomorrow. Don't tell anybody I told you, but she's, it's, it's a big one. <laughs> Nobody believes it, but she's turning. And, and so I'm, I'm going to get her this keto birthday cake, right? So I, I got to go an hour down river. I drove by a church uh, from a Lutheran church. The sign out in front, it had, it had hearts, kind of like the, the, the imagery. I don't know how that stuff works. I'm not artistic, but they were sort of layered. You know what I'm talking about? Kind of overlapping hearts, and they were all different colors. And then they had a rainbow on the sign, and it said, Love is love is love. God is love. In church, I'm seeing it more and more and more and more and more. A friend of mine was asked, he went and candidated for a Baptist church, and they asked him to come be the preacher, and he said, yeah, I will, but there's a couple lesbians here that have to be kicked off the church rolls if they're not going to get saved and get right. We can't accept that. The Bible says it's blatant sin, and it's wrong. You want me as your pastor, they got to go. You said in a, ba in a Baptist church. A Baptist church that was looking for a King James Bible-believing Baptist preacher. And had one before he came. It's crazy. That was the Corinthian culture. It's no new thing under the sun, folks. We just come full circle, that's all. Paul was dealing with the same mess back in his day. So we're, you and I got to realize that really fixing up the flesh and obsessing with the flesh and being all about that, that, that really won't get the job done. Have you ever tried? Come on, tried to serve God? Doesn't work, does it? You know why? I'm my biggest problem. The devil makes a breach into the body through the flesh. He works on the mind in verse number five. Look at that, casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The devil makes an attack on your mind. You see, since they had gotten the flesh right in chapter 1, now the devil said, all right, now I know what to do. Now I'm going to go after their minds. And he started with sending in these guys to start undermining the man that God had put there to teach them the Bible and preach the Bible to them. That's how they started. you got to separate the shepherd from the flock in order to kill the sheep, right? And we know Jesus Christ is our shepherd, but we get the type, you know, that, uh, the under-shepherd that God puts here. you got to start whittling them away from the man God gave them in order for you to set yourself up as the king and slaughter them for your own good. And what they'll do when they can't come between the pastor and the people is they'll say, man, he sure does have a tight grip on you, doesn't he? What makes him think he's the only one that knows? What makes him think that he's a real Bible-believing pastor like you got? He don't have a tight grip on you. But boy, the devil sure will start getting in your head, and the guy will come in there getting in your head, and the reason is because he wants the grip he thinks the preacher has. He's jealous. Trying to drive that wedge, he starts going after their minds. Notice, notice casting down what? Genesis 6, 5 talks about imaginations. God saw the imaginations of their heart was only evil continually. And Genesis 8, 21 says it was from their youth when it uses the words imaginations. You know what you got nowadays? A filthy generation. Forgive me for this if, if you think it's wrong, but my kids have been in public school and then we wound up having to pull them out. Now they're homeschooled, but it's through the, the state program, the K-12 program. 
And, and I'm talking 12 years old, 14 years, almost 14 years old in July. They're, they're on those, th those things and they got the little chats on there where the kids talk. And these little kids are girl to boy, boy to girl. Little kids. My daughter sent me a, a snapshot of one of them. She said there's an there's a, there's a, a, a online meeting for, for uh, um, LGBTQ, XYZ, and on and on it went to openly discuss this. The little, they're not even old enough to even be honestly engaging in that kind of thing. You've got to plant that stuff in their minds. You know what it is? It's a war against their mind. You know what the devil does to you? He wars against your mind. Does he not get in your thoughts? You know how imaginations come? How does it become an imagination? Like my dad told me when I was a boy, and I never forgot it, he said, if a bird flies over your head, it's not your fault. But if it makes a nest in your hair, because you didn't do nothing about it. The bird flying over the head is an illustration of a thought. Do you know thoughts can come from your own wicked heart, the imagination of their heart? Your own wicked heart can give you thoughts. You know that, right? But do you realize it's not always that? You know, sometimes you can have an unbelievable, obscene thought come into your mind. I mean, obscene. You all, we always think sensuality and, you know, all that kind of thing, and, and that can be it. But it can just be, do you see how he just snubbed me? Did you see how she just looked at me? You see how they act? You know, a thought can come into your mind that didn't come from your heart. You realize the devil has the power to cast darts at you. Put thoughts in your head. Billboard signs can do it. Technology can do it. Other people can do it. Hey, did you ever notice preacher? You know, he's a good guy, but... You know what you got to do with those thoughts? Because the thought, that's the seed. You begin mulling that thing over, that's the embryo. And then before you know it, there's imaginations. And you know what the devil's done? He's built a stronghold in your mind. You ever meet somebody who's miserable and they stay there and they almost seem like they're choosing to stay there? The devil built a stronghold in their mind. That's how he works. He'll go after your flesh. He'll build a stronghold there if he can. He'll get you addicted to drugs, get you addicted to alcohol, get you addicted to pornography, get you addicted to whatever he can get you addicted to. And if you get the flesh cleaned up like they did in 1 Corinthians, he's got a better plan. He's going to go after your mind now. And start getting in there, getting those thoughts going. You know what you got to do with those thoughts? You got to abort them. Because when you start playing around with that thought and thinking about that thing and mulling it over and imagining it, before long that imagination gets built up and now that, that thought process, it doesn't have to be all sensual. That thought process, that critical spirit, the way you view that brother or that sister, all you see when you view them is what it is that bothers you what it is that aggravates you, what it is that happened, what it is that they did, and you can't ever move by it, you're stuck with it. The devil's got a stronghold built, a tower built, in a place that's supposed to be exclusively for Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's a scary thing. He uses imaginations. Look at the second thing there in verse 5. When he's talking about attacking the mind, he uses the knowledge. You got all kinds of knowledge nowadays. Corinth had a culture permeated with knowledge, mental sin. You know, philosophy and education was all over the place in Corinth, like you got today. In Genesis chapter 3, verse number 5, Satan said, Ye shall be as gods knowing. That's how he wages war on the mind. All kinds of knowledge, sign of the end times. Everybody's a doctor nowadays, just Google it. You can come up with an answer for stuff that takes people years to study and try to figure out with the most elite technology that they can to try to dive in. And you can Google it and act like you know everything there is to know about the subject. Too much knowledge. We know so much about so much. We know too much about each other. The devil's got an inroad there into your mind because you know everything about brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so and what they're doing and what they bought and where they went and how they act and what they do and don't do. And you know way too much. It's a demonic thing. Knowing. 
Do you know modern philosophy did not show up until after the King James Bible, and it began with Rene Descartes in his dictum, I think, therefore I am. I think about something that bizarre. Like, duh. Oh, that's profound. That's demonic. You know, in the 17th century, the bulk of philosophy was dominated by scholasticism, written by theologians. Did you hear what I said? It was the preachers that got into philosophy and dominated it, and you know where they drew it from? Plato and Aristotle. And then in all these early church writings, they're always trying to convince you that we need, they found something older and better and all the rest of that stuff. It was all influenced by Plato and Aristotle in spite of what Colossians tells you about philosophy after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. And you know what the devil's done in our generation? He slid in a tro Trojan horse because he's politically conservative and now he's starting to talk about the Bible and Jesus and all the rest of this stuff and you got a bunch of, I'm going to go there, okay, so I don't want to tick everybody off already, brother, but it needs to be said, Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson, that man ain't even born again. Lucifer believes in Jesus Christ and knows the good things about the Bible. And now you got Bible-believing preachers that are fitting Jordan Peterson into their counseling and into their preaching. It's the same thing that happened back then. It's an attack from the devil on your mind. Well, you know, Jordan Peterson says, if somebody's this way, they're never going to change. I guess we're just going to have to divorce. After 20 years, after 30 years, I'm not going to live the rest of my life miserable. You're ruling out the Spirit of God. You're ruling out the work of God. You're ruling out the new man. Jordan Peterson don't know nothing about that. I don't care how smart he is. I could care less. I'd tell him straight to his face. You don't know nothing about that. Be careful. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. That's what we need this week. We need some more God. Preacher preached a great message Wednesday night. Now I'm done. I'm wrapping it up here. Great message Wednesday night. I listened on my way down. What we need this week is God. Your flesh is going to try to stop you from coming. Pardon the spit. My church is used to it. They don't even notice. I can't help it. Your flesh is going to try to stop you from coming. Something's going to happen throughout the week to offend you, tick you off, frustrate you, aggravate you. Something more interesting will be going on for your mind than being here. And those are tricks of the devil to keep you from pulling down some things that God may want you to pull down this week and getting the freedom and liberty and joy and filling and refreshing of the Holy Ghost of God to help you continue in your service to Jesus Christ. So the conclusion. Notice the parentheses in verse number 4. Stuck right between the flesh in verse 3 and the mind in verse 5, there's parentheses. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. No matter what it is, fleshy things, I, got, I, know, I know and have some in my church, hardcore drug addicts, hardcore, clean, not drug addicts anymore, born again, you'd never know it and I wouldn't tell you who they were. Leading people to Christ. I got half a dozen people in my church saved because of one guy's witness who used to be addicted to heroin just a few years back. God gave me the privilege of leading him to Jesus Christ, and he's reaching people like crazy, man. That's a stronghold. You understand the power of that thing? Whew. God pulled it down. How? Not with carnal weapons. Your preacher can tell you all about carnal weapons, the power of the United States Navy, man. Whew. Stuff's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing. Amen. Nothing compared to prayer. I hope you're asking God to do something for us this week. Amen. Compared to reading your Bible. That's the words of God. You need that book this week. Walking with God. Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. And the last thing is preaching. God hath in these due times manifested his word through preaching. I'm going to do my very best with the help of God this week to give you biblical messages and biblical messages only. 
because I believe that it is the Word of God and the preaching of the Word of God that helps God's people root out those strongholds and deal with those issues and get the victory in their heart and in their mind and in their life so that God can flood us and use us as we get closer and closer to the coming of Jesus Christ. All right, brother, you want me to turn it over to you or just pray and dismiss it? Okay, let's go ahead and pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, I love you this morning and I thank you for being a mighty God. Thank you for giving us these weapons of prayer and preaching and of the Word of God, Lord, of, of walking with you and the privilege it is to know you as our Savior. And I pray, Lord, as we continue on now here this week, I ask you, please, in the name of Jesus Christ, I beg you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to show up and speak to our hearts. Make me a blessing and, and manifest your word this week, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.